Jennifer. That's it, Buzzfeed. 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 It's the guy. When BuzzFeed started, we were this little lab in Chinatown. We were experimenting with ideas, and we started to notice that we could do these amazing things. We could reach millions of people. And the reason is that the internet had unlocked all of these awesome opportunities that people hadn't figured out yet. Alô, alô. Boa noite, tudo bem? Vocês estão me ouvindo? Sim? Tudo bom, gente? Meu nome é Vitor Nascimento, eu sou redator no BuzzFeed aqui no Brasil. E hoje eu vou entrevistar o Richard, que está aqui, diretamente de Nova York. Queria agradecer a todo mundo que está aqui, sexta-feira, à noite, né? Se vocês quiserem, depois a gente vai tomar uma cerveja, todo mundo. Eu queria começar apresentando o Richard, ele vai falar em inglês e eles vão traduzir para vocês, tá? É, eu vou ler um pouquinho do, do currículo dele, que é extenso. O Richard é responsável pela direção criativa e curadoria de conteúdo, além de liderar os times de criação, operações de marca e produção no Reino Unido, na Europa, Austrália, Japão, México, Canadá e aqui no Brasil também. O Richard já escreveu, dirigiu e supervisionou diversas campanhas publicitárias para empresas como Citibank, Amazon, Coca-Cola, BMW, Sky, Nestlé e Google. E como eu falei, hoje ele é o diretor criativo internacional do BuzzFeed. Então eu queria dar um welcome, Richard. I was giving a little introduction. I don't, I don't speak Portuguese, so I'm hoping whatever he just said was nice. Yes, it was. They can say it was all good. Um, so let's just start with a few questions. Um, eu vou perguntar em português e depois em inglês também, tá? Uh, eu soube que você começou como ator e agora você é diretor no BuzzFeed. Eu queria saber como é que você passou de uma coisa para outra e também o que, que significa o seu trabalho. O que, que você faz de fato hoje em dia no BuzzFeed? So, um, I hear you were an actor before going to BuzzFeed. So, I wanted to, uh, for you to explain a little bit of your career until you got here and what is it that you do at BuzzFeed? Sure. So, at BuzzFeed, I lead our creative production and operations teams internationally. Um, so, that is videos, posts, franchises, shows, and design work. Um, before that, as, as Victor said, I used to work in Hollywood uh, and I made, wrote, produced and sometimes badly acted in, uh, in movies and TV shows. And, and I think really the common thread through all of it is, is I have a passion for storytelling and for entertainment. Um, but I think the two worlds, the worlds of Hollywood and then the worlds of digital media um, a pretty different. E eu vou perguntar para ele o que que ele viu, o que que fez ele sair da mídia tradicional, Hollywood, filmes e TV para ir para a internet. So what made you decide to move to the digital world? So even though they're quite different, I see the worlds of traditional entertainment, Hollywood, let's say and the, the digital space colliding at quite a rapid rate. Um, but for me, the frustration that I felt in Hollywood was probably the lack of true data and audience understanding. So what I mean by that is making shows, making TV shows or movies, we didn't really know what people wanted, what people liked. Um, So instead, we would throw everything at one pilot episode, hoping that in that one episode, a whole audience would become fans of the show and become devoted to it. Or on the movie side, 
you would throw everything at one big box office weekend and hope that's where you, you know, you, you, you found an audience. And because of that, it led to basically a lack of originality with content or a fear of originality with content. Um, and I think it, what, what you see now in Hollywood and on TV is the same format being repeated again and again and again, or you see remakes, movies that were big 20 years ago being made again. And it just means there's, this, there's not this um, innovation and creative spark. Um, and I think that's because data is missing. And that's the big difference with the digital space. Um, you were saying the, about data. Can you elaborate a little bit on that difference to the access to data? I was asking him especifically, our né, panel talks a lot about the use of data and information de forma creativa. Então, eu pedi para ele elaborar um pouco, falar sobre é, essa questão do uso de, de conteúdo, de informação, de data, para é, conteúdo criativo. So, I think that, that's what's so exciting about the digital space, is we have access to this data to understand what people like, what people are watching, what they're engaging with. So, I think that is a massive difference that really empowers us in the digital space. And what that data gives us is it allows us as creatives to carve out a swim lane, let's say. We know people are interested in this. And then within that swim lane, we can ideate, we can try new things, we can be innovative. So I think that's the big difference and that's the power of data in the digital space. But then I think the other thing is speed, the speed that we can work. We um, can produce content distribute it and get feedback from an audience instantly. And that's incredibly powerful. Whereas traditional entertainment, you know, you, you make a movie six months later, it's distributed, and then you slowly find out what people think about it. So I think that speed and that access to meaningful data is, is what really powers the digital space. Falando in informação, uh, o que a gente fala de informação é público. É, que são vocês. Só para eu entender aqui, quem, que, quem é que segue o BuzzFeed nas redes sociais? Ah, tá. Todo mundo passou. Tá. Tá bom. Quem não segue, gente, vai lá, tá? Por favor. É, I was asking who here follows BuzzFeed on. Okay. Yeah, because now they all are going to. Good. Um, uma coisa que a gente não tem muito costume de ouvir falar é o uso de dados e tecnologia de informação com criatividade. Não é um não são duas coisas que andam muito bem juntas. Então, eu vou perguntar para ele, um, data and creativity usually are not used together in the same sentence. So, how do you explain how the two of them work? So, I think a very powerful cocktail is data mixed with creativity. Um, I think if we know what an audience is interested in, and we know what they like and don't like, that is a great foundation for us to do fantastic creative work. I'm not saying that that means there's, there's no place for like creative hunch or good ideas. There is, but if it's informed by data, that's when you really tap into something that can grow to an enormous scale. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, am I, am I talking too quickly for the translator or is it okay? Okay. Um, so I think it's that powerful cocktail. Uh, it brings about these amazing uh, results. And I think also it's a little bit of an erosion of creative ego. So typically in advertising and in storytelling, ideas have been dictated by like one person, a creative director, right? Someone who has a fancy title or is very experienced or has a creative hunch and they sort of dictate what's going to happen and everyone else does it. Data has kind of changed that. Um, data is, is, is actual, something tangible that we can hold on to, and that's what we can use as uh, the platform for our creative work. É, uma coisa que ele está falando sobre o formato criativo antigo, né, com o diretor de criação, vou perguntar para ele se ele acha que a tendência é esse formato tradicional de criação morrer. So do you think this traditional top-down format is going to die? What's going to happen? 
I don't think it's going to die necessarily, but it's been disrupted. And I think that's a brilliant thing. Um, because I think ultimately what's happened is the audience have become the creative director. They are the creative authority. And for us as consumers of content, that's excellent. Like, that's brilliant. We're the ones that are informing the content that we then watch and we consume. Um, and I think what we, we, we are already seeing with advertising as a whole, not just in the digital space, but everywhere, is a slow abandonment. Like people are stepping away from things that used to be seen as so important, right? Color palettes or fonts and style guides or slogans or really heavy sale messaging. That's been sort of replaced by meaningful content, content that you engage with and you connect over, content that serves you somehow. And that's something that we're particularly proud of at, at BuzzFeed. The content we make provides some sort of service to you, whether that makes you laugh, whether it makes you cry, whether it teaches you a new recipe, whether it, you know, it, 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 or a new way of doing something, it, it is of service to you. And that's way more powerful than any color or any slogan. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of that happening across the, the content space and advertising space. E porque uma marca como o BuzzFeed aprendeu a falar com as pessoas, claro que marcas também vão atrás dessa plataforma e tentam se comunicar com o público. Então, eu vou saber dele, que é a especialidade dele dentro do BuzzFeed, como que é o comportamento das marcas diante dessa novidade na produção de criatividade com dados, informações. So, talking about brands and branded content, does, is this challenging the way that brands think about talking to their audience? Yeah, I, I think it is. It's, again, it's disrupting what they're used to doing, but... I think the results are so powerful um, that they're embracing it more and more and we're seeing an evolution. Um, at, at BuzzFeed, our mission is, with advertising, with branded content, is not to interrupt the content people love, but be the content people love. So we don't treat it like an advert that's interrupting your favorite show or whatever you're scrolling on your newsfeed. We try to make our branded content awesome in itself so that you're choosing to engage with your branded content and i think if you crack that that's incredibly powerful but for me the most important thing is sharing if you as a brand make content that people choose to share that's unbelievable that is that is someone choosing to be the ambassador of your brand and your content um and i think that is achieved by not just trying to sell things to people, but by actually engaging and providing them with some sort of service or, or entertaining them so that people share it. And let's say it's food content, they share and say, mom, we need to make this recipe tonight. Or it's some cool post, funny post we did. Bruno, check out this cool post. That is so powerful when someone's sharing the content. So that's what we're always, we're always striving for. Um, Do you think that's the, the secret to BuzzFeed? Eu estou perguntando se ele acha que isso aí, essa filosofia, esse modo de pensar, tanto conteúdo quanto publicidade, é o, o segredo do sucesso do BuzzFeed? I, I think it's definitely really contributed to this growth that we've seen to, to, for BuzzFeed to be the enormous scale that it is. But for us, it's never just been about scale. Um, you know, it, it's, it's way more important to us that we understand how we're connecting with our audience. So if you look at food media, we don't just want to show everyone a recipe. We want to know, did they make that recipe? If they did, did it taste good? Um, if we showed them, a, 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 you know, if we distribute a quiz, a typical BuzzFeed quiz, we want to know how they engage. Did they find it entertaining? Did they share it? That's much more powerful than just hitting as many people as, as possible. And in the branded space, we want to work with different partners and show them the power of this machine and this way of thinking that we've created. And so recently, we've diversified all these different things that we do to allow brands to come in from large brands to small brands to see this power of making content that matters, making content that encourages people 
to share, not just content that gets seen by loads and loads of people. It just so happens it does get seen by loads and loads of people, but we connect it on a deeper level than that. E esse tipo de feedback do público é tudo que a marca quer, né? As marcas querem saber o que é que o público dela está pensando. Então, eu vou perguntar para ele como que ele acha que as marcas vão começar mais e mais e mais a se beneficiar desse feedback automático que a internet dá para gente. So, how do you think the, the, the brands are going to benefit from this um, feedback loop that you're talking about? So I, I used to be a stand-up comedian. I did some comedy, and I know that's very surprising because I'm not being funny at all today. Um, but when, when I was doing routines, there would be, people would laugh at the punchline, but then they would also laugh at other parts of the joke. And I was always fascinated why. I just wanted to know why. And because as soon as I found out why, I could expand that joke even more. And the next night, it could be a funnier set. And then the next night, a funnier set. And I think all I wanted to do as a comedian was have a really great show and make everyone have a great time. So I think that's a good example of this feedback loop that we consider at BuzzFeed. At BuzzFeed, we make and distribute 600 pieces of content a day. That's a day. That's a huge amount. And we learn and employ this feedback loop on every bit of content. So when we put something out, we see how did people engage? What did we learn from it? We take that information internally and reiterate, do it again, and keep learning that same feedback loop like I did as a comedian. Um, and I think for brands, it means that we know, we can tell, are people buying the products that we showed in our videos, or do they... Do they like the brand more because of the content that they made with us? Which is really opening up um, a, a pretty in, incredible connection for a brand with our audience. Um, and, and as I was saying earlier, a lot, a lot of publishers and platforms say they have a big audience. They don't. They have traffic. They have a lot of traffic. Whereas what we've, we dedicate ourselves to is creating and, and staying loyal to a dedicated audience. Someone that knows what they're going to get from us. We don't trick our audience. We don't shout at them, just try to get their attention with advertising content. We always obsess about connecting with them. And that's why they sort of stay dedicated to what we do. And um, going back to the point, I was, to, to what you were saying about how does this benefit brands, On our uh, franchise video, so a good example would be Tasty, Tasty Demise. We, uh, nine out of 10 comments that people write on those videos include a share. So there's someone tagging a friend in nine out of 10 comments. That's enormous. They've for, all done it. Todos já fizeram isso, né? Eu sei que vocês já fizeram. Uh, they've all done it. You've done it? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, But for a brand to see, again, that people are choosing to become ambassadors for their bit of content and share it amongst their family and friends, that's incredibly powerful. Well, talking about Tasty, we, a gente, todo mundo conhece o Tasty, né? O, o, os vídeos de comida que a gente está com fome no trabalho e fica vendo o povo fazendo bacon, batata, tudo aquilo ali. Todo mundo conhece. Vou falar um pouco sobre, especificamente, esse produto do BuzzFeed que... Começou em 2015 e é um absurdo assim de popularidade. Desde que ele foi criado, o BuzzFeed, já, o Taste, internacionalmente, acumula 58 bilhões de views. Bilhões. Cada vídeo tem, em média, 15 milhões de views. É uma, é uma coisa surreal. É, eu vou perguntar para o Richard por que, que ele acha que o Taste faz tanto sucesso no mundo inteiro. I was just giving them a few numbers about Tasty and Tasty Demise. Uh, why do you think Tasty has become this huge success? Um, I think, first of all, the content is food. We all eat food. We all need food. We think about food. I think about food too much. I eat food too much. Um, that is universal, right? There's no getting away from that. Also, we connect over food. Food is like the universal connector. You have a date and over food. You see friends over food, you have a meeting with food. So those two ingredients, excuse the pun, those two ingredients are perfect for us. 
but also on top of that, when we were when we were sort of investigating Tasty and figuring it out, we looked at traditional ways that food had been presented in media before. And I'm sure you've all remember food shows where it's this sort of perfect host, perfect chef or host in this perfect kitchen, unlike any of our kitchens, teaching you how to do this recipe that you would never be able to make with really complicated ingredients or whatever. And it wasn't relatable. It was entertaining, maybe, or interesting to watch, but there was, it wasn't relatable on a human level. And then as the way that they try to keep food networks, try to keep people engaged, was they tried to up the entertainment. So suddenly the hosts become really loud and they're swearing at everyone or really quirky and weird. And the recipes started getting a bit more weird um, or different or interesting ingredients. But again, the human connection wasn't there. So we found, we believe we found that human connection by getting rid of the hosts. And when you look at a tasty video, it's just like you were there in the kitchen making the food and those hands that you see could be your hands. And the ingredients we use are ingredients that we can get at a local supermarket. And the, the recipes themselves are things that are quite tempting to make. They're realistic things for us to make. Um, so I think a combination of all those things has, has made it the success it is. A gente vai assistir um vídeo agora do Taste Demais. É, vamos, vamos tocar o vídeo para vocês verem. Um vídeo feito em parceria com a Air France. <música> Agora eu estou com fome oficialmente. É, vou perguntar para o Richard, porque o, o sucesso do texto foi tão grande que o BuzzFeed começou a gerar, criar outros formatos inspirados nesse formato de shows que agora também são sucesso no mundo inteiro. Because of Buzz, uh, Tasty's success, BuzzFeed decided to um, invest in other shows that go a little bit um, towards that direction. Can you talk a, a little bit about them? Yeah. So we see them as franchises, and, and what we do is kind of use the Tasty engine, the way that we uncovered Tasty, we use that in other verticals or interests. Um, so you may have seen Nifty. Nifty is all about DIY and home improvement and that sort of thing. Top Knot, Top Knot is beauty and style. Um, Goodful is healthy things. Um, And then one of our most recent franchises, which is growing at a very fast rate and, and is my favorite, um, is called Bring Me. And Bring Me is all about travel and experiences. Um, so maybe we should watch it first and then I'll yeah. talk about it. A gente tem um vídeo do Bring Me também para vocês conhecerem. Pode dar o play aí, DJ.
So it looks pretty fun, right? Um, a, a little bit about that video. That, that is a bar in London that people didn't really know about. Londoners didn't know about. That video, I think, has 55 million views. And now there's a waiting list to go to this bar all the time. So that kind of shows the, the, the power of Bring Me, uh, you know, the power of what we can do. What, what, when we looked at travel and experiences, how it's been done traditionally, a lot of the time it's, if, if, if I was to say 10 things to do in Sao Paulo, it would be the t same 10 things on most websites would be the top suggestions, the touristy things. Um, or when I looked at hotels or restaurants and I look at images or pictures, they're very glossy, they're very artificial, they're lit perfectly. There's like a beach and there's like a guy with a six pack working out on the beach or something. It's unrealistic stuff, it feels out of reach. It doesn't feel, again, relatable. So what we're, what we're doing with BuzzFeed, with, with Bring Me, is taking experiences, travel destinations, and trying to showcase them in a very relatable way. So if you notice in that video, it's not perfectly lit. It's not beautiful photography. It kind of looks like we just all showed up there and saw this place for the first time. Um, and I think that's very, that's very um, enticing when you can kind of picture yourself being there. And the power of Bring Me is people comment and say, Nico, we're doing this this weekend, or bachelor party plans right here. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's growing very quickly. And we're actually working on our first, uh, in partnership with uh, Volkswagen. Volkswagen and BuzzFeed are working on the first Bring Me video here in Brazil at the moment. Uh, se estiver aceitando currículo para viagens, essas coisas, ou, if you're hiring for any trips and going to bars like that, just it's a cool let job, me know. right? Yeah, okay. yeah, really cool job. Uh, uma coisa que é interessante que a gente é, lá no BuzzFeed percebe é que vídeos nos Estados Unidos ou no Reino Unido começam a viralizar aqui também. Por causa disso, a gente está começando a produzir o Bring Me aqui no Brasil. Então, eu vou perguntar para o Richard como que ele pensa na hora de produzir um conteúdo de forma local, né, que as pessoas daquela cidade, daquele país consumam, mas também de uma forma global, porque a internet é um país sem fronteiras. So talking about, I was uh, telling them that um, we here in Brazil started watching a lot of Bring Me, and that's why we're starting to produce our own. Um, how do you think globally and locally for those contents? So. At BuzzFeed, we're very proud of being a global company. Uh, even though we started in America, we, we are now truly a global company that operates across all platforms. But we recognize that a one-size-fits-all approach to content doesn't work globally, right? Um, so we have dedicated expert creatives and data scientists in every location that we're in. Um, and they're the ones that are informing us of local trends, of tones, of sense of humor, all that sort of stuff. They run BuzzFeed in, in regions. Um, but what we do like to crack is formats that are universal. And I think Tasty and Bring Me are both good examples of that. That Bring Me video was shot in England, and it had English titles, but you guys totally understood it, right? Um, same with, same with Tasty. That Tasty Demise video we showed would be understood anywhere in the world. That format is universal. And it's what we refer to as post-literate, which is no dialogue um, and no things that, it, that are too region-specific visually that other people wouldn't understand it. So what that means is, if that Tasty Demise video is doing particularly well, we can, we can quickly change the titles on it into Japanese, into German, into Spanish, and we can distribute it to our other audiences elsewhere. Um, so it's pretty cool the speed that we can adapt, translate, and share things on a global scale, even if it was intended for one region. Uh, another example would be with our shows. I'm not sure if you guys have seen our, our shows before. One of them is called Worth It. Worth It is the biggest show on YouTube, and its ratings kind of rival that of top normal TV shows. Um, it is about 
tasting food at different price points in different cities. It's, it's in the US, it's in America, but we noticed that there was a very large British audience and they were commenting on the video saying, please come to London, do an episode in London, do fish and chips or do whatever. And so we did, and we did it very quickly. Um, we made the first international version of one of our shows that was born in America. Um, but it's that same format. The format is universal. We just changed the cast. Um, and we made sure we captured a British sense of humor. And we made sure we showcased British diversity, British cities, and British foods. But the format's exactly the same. Uh, so we released that last year, at the end of last year, and it's done, it's done very well. We have the trailer, and é, I apologize, gente... I'm, I'm in it. I'm sorry. A gente sorry. vai assistir o trailer, ele está participando do, do programa. Vamos ver. Worth it has a whole new series set in the UK. We're going to travel glorious Britain, try three different fantastic foods at drastically different price points. Four pounds, fifty pounds, two hundred and ten pounds, nine hundred twenty-five pounds. People share. You get me. Oh, I love alcohol. Anna. I'm having a fantastic time. Evelyn. The marshmallow. Um, Charles. Fancy ice cream going on tour through your mouth. The kebab king. We're not intoxicated, and we are about to enjoy kebab. And this guy, Joe. Oh, God, I like that one. And together we'll determine which is the most right, worth it. Right. The most exclusive dish on our menu, saffron pulcha. Really good. Such a riot of flavors. Black olive fried in panko. Valgue oh. beef made only in Japan. Wow, oh, my bro. Mm. Really tastes tea. Really dries out your mouth. It's slurking again. There's a small spoon of caviar. Drop 10 pounds worth. Qual que foi a comida mais cara que você comeu nesse no programa? What was the most expensive food you ate during Worth It? We ate a 2,000 pound, no, 1,000 pound kebab. Of what? It's a kebab. Um kebab de kebab like quase cinco mil reais. É isso. One thousand. It was a thousand pounds. Wow. Tá bom. Yeah. It wasn't very good. No. No. I'm not supposed to say that, but it just really wasn't very good. And Man. we have to be nice. Uh, we have por, to pretend. It was good. Tem que ser bom. Assim, it it ser was good, but that was a lot of money. Yeah, for a thousand pounds, you have uh, to like it. That's yeah. Like, Yeah. You have to say you liked it. É, eu vou perguntar para ele que a gente sabe que nos últimos anos as redes sociais foram invadidas por fake news, é, conteúdos inapropriados e uma série de coisas bem complicadas. É, e eu quero saber como é que isso afetou o trabalho dele, como é que isso mudou a forma dele pensar conteúdo para internet. Now we're living in a world of fake news and there's a lot of turmoil around social media and the internet. How did that affect your job and what do you think about that when you're working? Yeah, I think we, we, we now live in a, in a time where there's just this abundance of content everywhere. We're almost overwhelmed by content. Uh, and then as you said, false news reporting. Um, I think really all it means is now more than ever, we need impactful, meaningful content that's good, content that people engage with, content that people like and therefore share. Um, and so that, 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 that has always been our mission from day one. Uh, so I think we're, you know, we, we weather that storm very well. Um, but I think that is the big learning for everyone in this digital space is, you know, great content, meaningful content will shine through. That'll, that's that's what will last through this weird turbulent time. Um, Yeah. Tem uma outra coisa também que muito da internet que a gente consome hoje em dia está no Facebook, né? Muita gente, inclusive, acredita no, no dia a dia que a internet e o Facebook são a mesma coisa. É, só que o Facebook ele tem uma série de problemas e ele muda muito é, os, os parâmetros de, do que vocês veem. Né? Tipo, eles mudam os algoritmos e tudo mais. Eu vou perguntar para ele como é que isso afeta também a vida dele. How much of a pain in the ass is Facebook for you. <laughs> Basically that, that's all I need to know. 
Um, you didn't say that in Portuguese. You said something really like elaborate, and then for me, yeah. you just said the little. <laughs> um, look, but BuzzFeed was born online. Um, and we now operate over 30 plus platforms. So in our lifetime, we have seen so many changes, so many algorithm changes, so many audience behavioral changes, platforms coming and going, and we ride with those waves all the time. We stay ahead of it. We, we were born online and uh, you know, we, we, we keep our focus on building a devoted audience and serving that audience with meaningful content and it, 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 we can already see that with Facebook's most recent algorithm change, we're staying ahead of that uh, and, and, and we're adapting with those newsfeed changes very successfully. So it's fine. E agora vamos perguntar um pouco para o futuro, né? O que, que ele está pensando para agora 2018 e para o futuro para o BuzzFeed e os produtos que ele cria? What about the future? What's next for BuzzFeed? Um, where, where are you looking into? What, what, where do you see these shows going? And tell us a, a, bit, a, bit, a little bit about that. So I'll break it into two levels maybe for BuzzFeed Brazil. Uh, this is a very, very exciting time. BuzzFeed Brazil is growing at an enormous rate. We have 76 million uh, monthly users on our Facebook properties. Our business side is growing year over year. We're working with fantastic brands. Um, and we've also opened up the possibilities of what we can do. So we have all our franchises that, that, that we now have on offer here and are building incredibly successfully. Um, also, BuzzFeed has opened globally, has opened up its business uh, into new revenue streams, one of which is consumer products. So we're making things. Um, and the other is studios doing more in, in, uh, so in shows like traditional TV and, and, and film shows. Uh, so the, the, the future is just huge and really bright. And I think, I think it all comes back to what I've said a few times now, which is just serving our audience, building our audience and taking pride in the content that we make. Um, and always, always taking it, you know, just, just, focusing really on what we're doing and making sure we're doing things the best. We, we have this saying, internal saying at BuzzFeed, which is humble confidence. And I, I humbly believe that we know the internet better than anyone else. Um, and, and if we continue doing what we're doing, I think many doors are going to continue to open in this exciting space. And we have our audience to thank for being devoted to us during, during this time. Agora a pergunta mais importante. Eu ouvi falar que quando ele era ator, ele atuou no primeiro filme do Harry Potter, gente. Eu vou ter que perguntar para ele. <laughs> This is the most important question of the night. I heard that you acted in the first Harry Potter movie. <laughs> is that true? Tell me about that. Look, I auditioned for a role and I didn't get it. And they said, but you can have this other role. So I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. The other role was like an extra in the very back of the big hallway. You know the big hall where they eat and everything? So if you pause it at the end, you see tiny, you see my face, and I'm desperately trying to be seen by the camera. That's, that's, uh, so that is not acting. That is just me making sure I'm seen in the movie. Mas já vale, tá valendo. Eu adoraria ter participado. Gente, eu queria agradecer vocês, queria agradecer a Campus Party também pelo convite de trazer a gente aqui. É, vou agradecer o Richard também. I would like to thank you a lot for coming um, all the way from New York to talk to us. I hope you guys had a great time. Espero que vocês tenham gostado. A gente fica por aqui, mas vocês podem seguir a gente na internet, curtir, compartilhar, pode xingar também. E a gente se fala aí na internet e continuamos esse diálogo legal. Would you like to say anything? Thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am.